dans les forêts pluviales de la Colombie-Britannique, une femme écoute les arbres. La scientifique Susan Zimmer est une vedette de l'écologie forestière. Ses recherches ont révolutionné notre façon de voir la nature. Elle a montré que les arbres communiquent entre eux. Ils s'échangent des messages grâce à un réseau souterrain de racines et de champignons. Les plus grands veillent sur les plus petits. En octobre dernier, nous sommes allés à la rencontre de Suzanne Simard à Port Renfrew, dans le sud de l'île de Vancouver. So, as a child, you would spend your summers in the Monashi Mountains. So, mm -hmm. so what memories do you have of, uh, of that uh, time? Yeah, my grandfather was a horse logger, and so um, we got to be, you know, part of this family logging operation, really. And so my great-grandfather, my grandfather, all my uncles <laughs> were all horse loggers. Um, and we got to kind of trail along and um, see the whole thing. So it was pretty exciting and it, it was all we knew. So we only knew the bush. We called it the bush. <laughs> so your grandfather was a horse logger. How has the logging industry changed since the time he was logging? Yeah, it's changed dramatically. So imagine like when you're working with horses <laughs> and, and really these trees are, are huge. They're, you know, they're old growth trees. So they're like a meter or two in diameter. And to cut down an old tree like that with a cross cut saw or even the early chainsaws, it would take a day or two to cut down a tree. And so they didn't log a lot of trees <laughs> in the summer. And it was what we call selective logging. So they would just take the ones that they could, that they could sell Um, often they were the understory trees, the cedar poles, um, for making telephone poles at that time. Industrial logging, on the other hand, which is when I became a forester, is dramatically different. That's where you take it, they take everything. And when those plans were made, that was before climate change, that was before anybody worried about biodiversity. Suzanne Simmer a suivi les pas de ses ancêtres. Au début de sa carrière, elle a travaillé pour l'industrie forestière. Elle a vite constaté que les choses ne tournaient pas rond. Les arbres replantés par l'industrie, après une coupe à blanc, étaient chétifs lorsqu'elle les comparait aux jeunes pousses dans les forêts naturelles. And so I started pulling them up and I noticed that, you know, this difference in the root systems of these two dramatically different starts to life where the ones that were the planted seedlings with the plug, their roots hadn't really grown outside the plug after a year or two, whereas the naturally regenerated seedlings were growing all over the place and covered with these fungi. Les champignons dont parle Suzanne Simard, ce sont de longs filaments qui poussent sous terre. Ils forment de vastes réseaux souterrains qu'on appelle le mycélium. So if we if we dig around here um, under the soil, we should see some of that mycelium. It's hard to see in these. You can see some of the threads. Yes. This is all the white, that white sort of opaque look to it. Right. That that's the mycelium. Okay. But you know, in drier or high elevation forests, it actually looks like a spider web when you're mm. when it's below ground. You actually see this thick web. In these wetter forests, it's harder to see, mm -hmm. um, but it's all there. Ce mycélium se connecte aux racines des arbres. Ils s'entraident mutuellement. That mycelium coats every soil particle, every pore is coated with mycelium. And those mycelium sort of work on those soil particles to get at the nutrients and then they absorb the nutrients and deliver them back to the tree in exchange for photosynthate from the tree. À l'époque où elle travaillait pour l'industrie forestière, tout cela était encore nouveau pour la jeune scientifique. I was pulling these trees up as a young forestry student and going, wow, maybe this is the why these trees aren't doing so well and these naturally regenerated ones are doing so great. Maybe it's because of their root systems 
And after many years later of studying this, I'm pretty confident that's what that was. You wanted to deepen your understanding of the forest, so you went back to school, to university. What did you want to understand? I grew these, this experiment where I had paper birch Douglas fir in these little plots. And so I, I labeled with isotopes the paper birch with one isotope, carbon-14, and the Douglas fir with another isotope, carbon-13, at the same time in these plastic bags that I injected you know, these isotopes and then they breathed it in or they photosynthesized it in, um, created sugars, and then those isotopes isotopically lab labeled sugars went down into the roots and they transmitted back and forth between birch and fir. It was absolutely fascinating that they were moving, it was moving back and forth. And so then I did this thing where I started shading Douglas fir more and more. And I did that because forestry practices at the time were thinking birch was this, and they still do, <laughs> this evil tree, this competitor that was robbing the firs of light and therefore, you know, we're actively herbiciding them cutting them down, hacking them away, just trying to get rid of them from, from our ecosystems as a competitor. And what I found is that the more birch shaded fir, this evil birch, the more carbon it sent to Douglas fir. And so it was not just a competitive thing, it was collaborating at the very same time. So you show that forests are social creatures. It shows they are social creatures, yes. So how did the industry react to, to that finding? There was a huge resistance because what I was saying is you need to keep these birches in these plantations. And that was, you know, there was a whole industry set up to get rid of them. La chercheuse, qui était devenue professeure à l'Université de la Colombie-Britannique, n'a pas baissé les bras. What is it about these trees? They hug you. Come and stand here. Elle a poussé plus loin ses recherches sur les réseaux de communication entre les arbres. Is this a mother tree? This is a mother tree. How do you know? Uh, it's huge. <laughs> it's huge. It's one of the biggest trees in the forest here. Suzanne Semer a découvert que les plus grands et les plus vieux arbres de la forêt protègent les plus jeunes. Elle les a baptisés arbres mères. We've done several studies that show that Douglas fir recognizes its kin and um, sends more carbon to them, supports bigger mycorrhizal networks, they're more nutritious. So that's why we started calling these big old trees mother trees, is because we realized they really were nurturing, really mothering the forest to regenerate. What happens when the trees die. When the trees die, um, it's a process. Yeah. It's not like a sudden death. It's, it's usually a long process, especially in mm -hmm. these old forests. They become old and weaker at some mm -hmm. point, and as they're dying, they start distributing their carbon to their neighbors, especially to their kin seedlings, mm -hmm. um, so that that energy doesn't just dissipate into the atmosphere, it's actually directed into the new generation of trees. So how is the Mother Tree project going now? Have you finally gotten the recognition from the scientific community that you were looking for? So the Mother Tree project, the NSERC project, mm -hmm. it follows a climate gradient all the way from northern British Columbia to the border with the mm -hmm. US, and it follows the distribution of Douglas fir. We have about 25 forests, um, and in all these different climatic regions from hot and dry to cold and wet. And within each one of those climatic regions, we have we're comparing different ways of saving mother trees com and comparing that to clear cutting. So what's the, the solution? Is it, should we keep clusters instead of clear cutting? Is that, is that what you're exactly. finding? That's exactly it. So we've looked at leaving these clusters and we've found that regeneration is way better. And so really what happens is that when you take out the mother trees, the network really dismantles. Things, the connections go way, way, way down because these big old trees are the most highly connected, right? right? This right. one yeah. will be connected to all of the cedars around it. Okay. And if yeah. you take yeah. this one out, yes. then its networks with these other cedars will collapse. Okay. En 2021, Suzanne Semer a publié un livre, Finding the Mother Tree. 
c'est rapidement devenu un best-seller. The reason I wrote this book, I had published my research in, you know, a couple hundred journal articles already, and nobody was listening to it. You know, I had just made these incredible discoveries about how forests work, and we're still clear-cutting and herbiciding, and things have not changed. So I wanted to get to the people and say, you know what, what? We need to decide about our forests. We need to decide if we want to keep them healthy. And so I wanted to write this book that everybody could read. You've been compared to Rachel Carson. You've become a star. Hollywood is going to make a movie about you. Did you ever think forestry would bring you such fame? And how do you explain it? Not a chance. <laughs> <laughs> Honestly, like the expectations were really low, <laughs> but um, forests were my life, right? Like that's all I knew. I love them to death, I, and I know that the world depends on them, and um, and so I've just I've just persisted, and you know, in spite of all the setbacks, you know, the forest always guided me to do this work. <laughs> I know that sounds kind of corny, but I was always in it for, for, for looking after our forests, and I will not stop until I'm dead. Mm -hmm.